in the early 90s, uh, uh, I was spending a lot of time trying to develop uh, uh, programs and interventions to make preschool uh, a better experience. And uh, one day I was out at the Bellport Head Start Center. I was uh, going to make a spiel to, uh, to parents at the beginning of the year to sign so that they would sign the permission form to be in the studies that we were doing. And uh, not many parents uh, showed up. I noticed a young uh, mother, she was, uh, I saw her walking in with two kids and uh, she was there for my presentation. The kids were off uh, being cared for while the parents uh, had a chance to hear about the upcoming year. And when I finished up and was leaving, she was leaving too, I saw that she had her four-year-old by the hand and uh, what I think was probably an 18-month-old in a stroller and she was heading down the road. It was hot, and I uh, stopped and asked her if uh, she needed a ride home, and she accepted it, and I thought I was taking her a couple of blocks. Uh, it turned out that uh, she lived two miles away. She'd walk there with the two kids. I dropped her off at what I think was probably a crack house, and I said, you obviously made a tremendous effort to, uh, to be here this evening. Uh, uh, what's up? And she said, uh, I just want to do what's best for my babies. And for me, that's been a, a, a touchstone uh, ever since. I'm in favor of government investment in pre-K services for families like that and kids like that. I, I think they need it. For me, the question is, how are we going to make an investment that really works rather than investment that simply makes us feel good? And my reading of, of the literature is different from Deborah's and different from, from the panel's consensus. I think it's very hard to design a pre-K program for four-year-olds that produces sustained effects. And let me give you examples of research that support my pessimism about the ability to do that based on what we presently know. First, I'll start with the very research I was trying to get uh, the mom who I was just describing to sign the permission form to be a part of. So what I and my colleagues did for a number of years is we developed shared book reading interventions in pre-K. It's an approach called dialogic reading. It involves uh, uh, switching the usual story circle where the adult holds a book and reads it to the child to an interactive process where children are talking about the book, learning vocabulary. And it's been a very effective intervention. We had demonstrated, uh, we've dem demonstrated our own research team that it works, it raises vocabulary substantially, and it's been replicated by others. Uh, we did longitudinal research in which we followed various cohorts who were experimentally assigned to receive the intervention or not into elementary school. And what we found uh, to our disappointment is that the effects were sustained through kindergarten, but by the time the kids got to first or second grade, there was no difference between children who'd been exposed as intervention in Head Start and those who had not. The fade out issue that, that Deborah described. When I first came to uh, the US Department of Education uh, to lead the Institute of Education Sciences, uh, one of my uh, uh, big bets was on uh, something called the Preschool Education, uh, Curriculum Education Research Project. Uh, the federal government uh, funded 14 randomized trials around the country. Uh, it was competitive, so the people who got the money to put the, the interventions in place and to evaluate them uh, presented uh, positive evidence that what they were going to do worked that would improve uh, pre-K programs. So 14 interventions, 14 uh, new, powerful, presumably powerful curriculum uh, interventions, again, random assignment. Only one of the 14 produced an effect that lasted through the end of kindergarten. 10 of the 14 produced no measurable in impact on any of the 20 outcome measures that were employed at either the pre-K year or the kindergarten year. And yet, I certainly went into this with high hopes that we'd get uh, large impacts. I was talking about, well, we'll get a list here of things that work and don't work, and states can, if they're smart, choose off the list of effective programs. Well, again, uh, disappointing. One that worked for a little while, and uh, most produced no impact at all. 
<clears throat> Even Start is a, was a federal program now canceled uh, in part because of evaluation findings. It was a family intervention. Give the parents job training. Uh, you give the kids high quality pre-K. Uh, uh, two randomized trials, uh, both showing no impact on either parents or kids of the intervention. Uh, and there was no need to do a follow-up because there was no impact at the end of the pre-K uh, pre year. <coughs> Thinking that there was something wrong with even start, we invested in uh, an enhancement program for Even Start that put two uh, seemingly very strong uh, literacy curriculum in Even Start. Again, random assignment, uh, no impact. Early Reading First was another federal effort while I was in the US Department of Education to try to improve uh, pre-K uh, programs. This one used a regression discontinuity design comparing uh, applicants who got the money and those who just missed the cutoff point so they didn't get the money. Uh, very small impacts on just one outcome measure. You've heard from Professor Armour about the National Head Start Impact Study. It's the largest, uh, best piece of social science we have on a large scale uh, preschool intervention. Uh, good impacts at the end of the Head Start year, uh, no sustained uh, impacts. Uh, and uh, a couple of, couple of presenters have mentioned Tennessee's voluntary pre-K program. Again, impacts at the end of the pre-K year, random assignment, no impacts at the, end of, uh, at the end of first grade. So you look at this, and I'm focusing on, uh, on the best design research, research in which random assignment is, is employed. And I don't see how you come away with it thinking we know what to do. I come away with it thinking I wish we knew what to do. Uh, but I don't think we do. And then you look at the larger body of literature, including uh, non-experimental studies of Georgia and Oklahoma, that take advantage of comparing the fact that Georgia and Oklahoma put their universal programs in place in particular years. There are other states that did not. You look at gains on the National Assessment of Educational Progress for Georgia and Oklahoma. You look for gains over the same period for the states that don't have a universal pre-K program. The effects are very small and limited to, uh, to particular subgroups. So again, my reading of the literature is that it's hard to have an impact. Not impossible, but it's hard. If you delve into subgroup differences in these studies, you find, I think, without a debate in the research community, that the largest impacts are on the kids in greatest need. They're kids from the most economically disadvantaged families. Over and over again, we find the largest impacts for kids uh, from non-English speaking uh, families. And so I think there are glimmers of hope here, at least in terms of who is most likely to be affected. But I don't think we yet know how best uh, to affect them. So why might that be, and what does it have to do for, uh, uh, for social policy? Well, we've heard Deborah mention some of the possibilities here. Maybe the interventions are not strong enough. Maybe there's fade out, but there's sleeper effects that come back in adolescence and, 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 and in, in adulthood. Maybe we're not measuring the right thing. I think there's another possibility, at least, that needs to be on the table. Uh, in uh, uh, the biological uh, arena, it's called uh, uh, average expectable environments. There's a demonstration across a range of species that within a range of average environments that the developmental progression occurs and isn't much affected by variation within the normal range. Sandra Scar, developmental psychologist who influenced me a lot uh, a number of years ago, uh, reconceptualized this in terms of parenting as the good enough parent. If you're good enough, lots of things will happen, and there's not much variation across good enough parents in terms of the impact that they have uh, on kids. Uh, the correlation for unrelated siblings raised in the same families on broad outcomes like IQ is about 0.20. And you square that to get the variance accounted for. So about 4% of the variance 
in outcomes for children who are unrelated. These are adopted kids raised in the same families. Uh, it is a very small impact of, of the family environment. So maybe in 21st century America, with the increasing access to educational resources, a variety of, of, of sorts, increasing awareness by parents that they need to interact with their children, that they need to talk with them. Uh, maybe a lot of the environment is good enough. And being good enough, it's difficult to show impacts by improving the curriculum in, 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 in an intervention for a broad array of four-year-olds. If that's true, or maybe if some of these other things are true, I think they lead to a set of policy uh, conclusions that I'm relatively comfortable with. One is that targeted investments make more sense than universal investments. If the kids most likely to be affected are the kids in greatest need, let's put the most of our resources in that area, rather than spreading the, use, uh, the resource universally and thereby allowing parents who would otherwise pay for this out of their own pocket to get you know, free tuition for a pre preschool program. I would rather spend $10,000 a year on families in need than $5,000 a year on every family uh, with a four-year-old. I think that multi-year intensive uh, programs are more likely to have an impact than a program for four-year-olds. So let's start early, let's have nurse visitation, <clears throat> let's have other interventions, again, on the kids who need it most, the families who need it most, that help them early on. And in doing that, let's, re, let's uh, reformulate uh, the federal block grant program, which supports uh, parents who have to work because of, uh, of uh, welfare to work requirements. And basically, states are set up so that parents get a voucher. And uh, the more they can save on their pre-K expenses, the better they are. So they buy the cheapest thing they can find, which is not the way we want to go. Let's uh, continue to let parents choose. But let's provide them with information. It's a classic uh, government function. If you're in the stock market, you get uh, reports on, on, on the stock itself, on the, on, on the business underlying the stock, and those are regulated by the federal government. Let's let people understand the important choice they're making by real information on parent satisfaction and the progress of children as they go through various uh, programs. And let's, if we're going to do this at the federal level or the state level, let's construct systems that can learn systems that are subject to feedback loops, where we can find out what's working and what's not and move ahead. I think that is a recipe for a rational investment. I think the belief that uh, if we invest a dollar, we'll get $7 back, not paying attention to who we invested on or how we invest it is not rational. Thank you.